Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word. Lord, and let there be light. As we gaze on your kingly brightness, so our faces display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirrored here, may our lives tell your story. Shine on me. Shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Some people are excited because it's summertime and school has let out, so exciting days there. I know that we're excited over at our daycare as well. We got summer camp started up this week. Excited about it. They had chapel in here earlier today. Just some neat opportunities to be able to plant the seed of the gospel in the hearts of folks uh, and excited about our summertime ahead. And tonight, we think about the opportunity. We just uh, had sung about that idea about shine, Jesus, shine. And we need Jesus to shine continually in our hearts. And we also need to make sure as a church family, we are continuing to shine Jesus Christ to the hearts of other people in our community as well. So let's look forward to what God's going to do tonight. Let's praise him and honor him as we begin our service this evening. Let's have a word of prayer as we get started. Lord Jesus, we thank you for shining your wonderful light into our lives. We thank you that you came as the light of the world. We thank you for illuminating us and showing us the truth of scripture and your love and grace. We thank you for those of us who know you, that you've changed our lives. We ask that you would help us to be that light, to reflect it and to shine it to others, that they too might come to the saving knowledge and relationship that they could have with Jesus Christ as well. Lord, we're thankful to be able to fellowship, to be able to lift you up. We ask that through this service here, and for those who may be watching online too, we ask that you would encourage each and every one of us as we look into your word to understand your truth and to understand your love as well. We ask that you would bless this service now. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Amen. If you came in tonight and you did not get the outline, I want to encourage you. I know there's several of you that are normally involved in our Olympian program and aren't used to being in the auditorium, but the teens took your job tonight, right? And so um, anyways, we're glad that you're a part of our service in here, but those outlines are available in the back. You can pick one up. It'll help you follow along with tonight's series. The pastor's been going through several weeks um, on America's culture crisis, and so I know you'll enjoy the study. It gives us a, it gives us a tool to help us answer or other people's questions that we come in contact with in our community uh, that are, are, are seeing a lot of uh, what's going on in America's culture. So pick one of those outlines up. Of course, those are available online. Some of you bring your device to church or you're watching online tonight, and you can go to uh, odbc-church. Dot com And there's a place there where you can find tonight's outline to follow along. And then I do want to remind you at the close of the service, we'll spend some time in prayer. And so if you have a connecting card, there's some available in the seats in front of you. You can fill out your prayer request and we'll get that from you at the end of the service. Or if you're watching online or you want to go fill it out online, it's connect dot odbc churchcom There's a place there once you fill it out at the bottom for prayer requests. And we will be having our prayer time. We won't be streaming that. So if you're watching online and are concerned about that, you, you don't have to worry about that. We'll just spend some time in here um, over those requests. So don't forget about those things. Let me remind you too, let's continue to be faithful in our giving. We've seen God's blessing over this last year and looking forward to some great things, opportunities for growth. I know Pastor talked about that on Sunday evening. 
in our, our meeting. And so let's just continue to be faithful in what God's called us to do and how he's blessed us in giving back. Um, and then I want to remind you about Pastor Sermon Series. Man, it's been an incredible series. I mean, all his series are incredible, so I don't want to make it sound like so. But this series, he's talking about taming the tongue and, and some things dealing with family. And I know I, I mentioned, I think last week, sometimes we go, oh, that's that's family. Well, we're all a part of a family. We're part of a church family. We all have, have a family that we're a part of and, and how to communicate with one another. I do want to mention, though, this Sunday, we're going to take a little bit of a break from that. It's going to be a special service. We're going to, of course, honor it with it Memorial Day weekend. We'll take some time to honor those that gave their life for our country. Uh, Pastor Ryan's going to be preaching in the morning service. So it'll be a little bit of a break from the series, but then we'll pick back up the next week, and I know you'll enjoy it. Invite people to be here for those services. And then uh, a lot of things going on this summer. VBS is around the corner. I encourage you. We have a meeting on June 6th, that evening, that Sunday night, for all the VBS workers. And so make sure you sign up for that. VBS is going to start on the 13th, the Sunday night, and it's going to go through Thursday night. And that's going to be from 6 to 8.30. And so if you can help us, I mean, it can be from maybe you want to help with snacks or or you want to stay with some kids, some groups through the evenings or game time. There's just a lot of places to get involved. And so uh, make sure you sign up, register to volunteer, and then you can also reg- register your children on church. Dot com. And then uh, there's other things like our Freedom Sunday around the corner. We're uh, a little a month and a half away from that. Um, and then Kids Music Camp. There's teen announcements, not just with uh, Teen Extreme Camp. I know that's on the, the slide here, but there's also a calendar of some of the events that they have. So if you want to check that out, summerodbc church. Dot com, and that's just the easy way to get to all our summer events. And one of those things highlighted, and go ahead and show the next screen, is our Wow Wednesdays. We've been talking about it, and I know some of you are like, what are they talking about? But we've changed things up a little bit this summer uh, for our Wednesday nights. We're trying to make a basically a church family to church family night and get everybody involved. Uh, we're going to have some some fun things going on in the service. Uh, the kids will be in here. And then following, we're going to be doing um, sometimes some fellowships or different things following the service. So next Wednesday night, we'll all meet in here, 7 o'clock. And then next week's theme, we're going to be going through abounding fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, and it's going to be love. And so the theme is love me some more. And how many of you like s'mores? You know, when you think about uh, campfires and different things, my little boy, Billy, the youngest one, this week, the weekend, he came home, he goes, next week, I'm going to campfire. And like, campfire? What are you talking about? He got mixed up because summer camp, but camp st- stuck out to him. And so he's talking about summer camp, but he kept calling it campfire. He was going to campfire. Um, but anyways, we, we will have some, some fires so you can toast some of those s'mores, and, and it'll be just a good time uh, uh, spent together. So be here next Wednesday night. I know sometimes you say, we're going to change things up, and everybody goes, uh, I don't know about that. You need to come, okay? Uh, on the website, you'll, you'll see it talks about the fact is the Bible clearly tells us as an older generation to pass down things to our younger generation. But then also Paul encourages Timothy. He says, you know, he said, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example. And we have an opportunity to learn from our young people too. Sometimes the energy they have about serving God, we could take a little bit of that. Um, And so we're just going to be spending some time together in worship through the summer, and we're really looking forward to how God can use it. So I want to remind you about that. Well, would you stand? We're going to sing one more time. Um, uh, some some more old music. This is just some things that I'm thinking about tonight's uh, series and what we've been going through. These are songs that just stuck to me. So we're going to start with Are You Washed in the Blood? And then we're going to finish with There is a Fountain. So let's sing it together. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? 
Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunged beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, and there may I, Though vile as he wash all my sins away, ere since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die, and shall be till I die, and shall be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Amen. Great singing tonight. You can be seated. Amen. If you would open your Bibles tonight, we're going to start out in Leviticus 18 and verse number 22. And I hope you have your hand out. We're going to be looking tonight at this subject, America's homosexual movement. And we've been going through this series about America's cultural crisis, talking about and looking at several different topics that have affected our country. I think it's an important thing to make sure that we are in tune and understand what's going on in our culture. And by the way, not just our culture, but also the culture of our world as well. And this has become a topic a growing topic around the world, too, and it's something that we need to understand and looking at it since we live in the United States, understanding it also from an American context uh, is important as well. We just sang those songs just reminding us, are you washed in the blood? And there is a fountain. And understanding when it comes to this subject of homosexuality, uh, is there forgiveness for it? Absolutely. We need to understand that from Scripture, too. In fact, I'm going to wrap up our study tonight looking at that very fact. But Leviticus, Leviticus 18 and verse number 22 is where we're going to start out. And the Bible says this, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, says it is an abomination. We look at this here, of course, in the context, speaking uh, especially to a male uh, headship uh, there when it comes to the description. And when it comes to this idea 
We understand that, uh, you see in the introduction of your note, says, in a matter of a few decades, the homosexual movement in America has transformed the nation's perception of homosexuality in ways thought to be nearly impossible. Now, leading up to this study, we've already looked at America's sexual revolution. And when it came to America's sexual revolution, it really opened the door for the homosexual movement uh, to really launch and to become full court press in our own nation as well. Continues on there, it says, the leaders and proponents of this movement are greatly motivated, trained, and financed. They are skilled in communication, politics, education, and even in religion. They are unashamedly focused and dedicated to the goal of normalizing and integrating their lifestyle into American culture, laws, and acceptance. So when we start to think about this, let me just kind of uh, give a little bit of a background and a foundation for this lesson. Uh, when we think about the idea of the term homosexual and homosexuality used really comprehensively to represent what society refers to in our community and in our world as the LGBT also has been expanded with Q, plus and several other abbreviation letters over the years. And so we start to think about that. We're really kind of thinking about that in an all-encompassing way. We start to think about this tonight, and I hope this will be a, a help to you and an encouragement as we think about what's going on in our world. Let's have a word of prayer as we jump into our study. Lord Jesus, thank you for your goodness. I ask that you would bless this study. Help us to understand it in our context of our nation and our world, but especially as we understand it from the context of Scripture and your perspective. Lord, we thank you for what you'll do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We look at this. Here's a few ideas when it comes to America's homosexual movement. Number one, when it comes to background information, kind of launching, understanding how does this come to be? Uh, how do these things come to light in our nation? And of course, I think you know this. You can see your notes. There's a lot to go through, so I'm not going to belabor any one individual point uh, at this point. Uh, we think of this tonight, but we look at your letter A. Most of the laws regarding homosexuality in the American colonies were derived from the English laws of buggery. If you were to think about American America's foundation when it comes to our laws, maybe a new term for you, buggery, uh, there, but uh, it's, that term buggery is a British slang term for a despicable person, most often a man. It's a vulgar term for a sodomite or a homosexual, but when it came to those laws, they were considered to be buggery laws, okay? So that's kind of the history of those laws, and of course, most of America, we uh, used English common law, the influences uh, as being American colonies initially, and those, uh, those terms were kind of transferred over. So the punishment in all of the colonies for homosexual acts was the death penalty. So we understand when it came to the Amer early American foundations of our country, uh, we know that for homosexual acts specifically, uh, death was the penalty for it. Letter B, uh, we're looking at June 28th, to June 3rd, sorry, to July 3rd, 1969, there was the Stonewall Riots. The Stonewall Riots are generally considered the starting point of America's modern homosexual movement. We think about this, and I'll give you the information so that we think about Stonewall Riots, considered to be the starting point. Uh, underneath that, there's a bullet. The riots were a series of spontaneous, violent demonstrations by members of the homosexual community against a police raid at the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village, the neighborhood of Manhattan, New York City. And if you ever go to Manhattan, you can go to Greenwich Village. Greenwich Village is still there. Um, and it's kind of considered to be like ground zero for the homosexual movement, um, especially in New York and in our country itself. Of course, if you look at even current things that go on when it comes to homosexual marches that occur in New York City, uh, we can see that it sets the foundation of even in recent news, uh, these have uh, this uh, event, the Stonewall riots have come up in recent news as well regarding New York City police officers, just in case we we're wondering. Letter C, within six months of the riots, two homosexual activist organizations were formed in New York City, concentrating on rights for homosexuals. So we think about this, we can see oftentimes when it comes to, comes to riots and things that happen, oftentimes what happens is things tend to institutionalize. That did happen, and because of that, there were two homosexual activist organizations that did form after that event in 1969. Letter D, June 28, 1970, not too long after that, was the very first gay pride marches that took place in New York, as well as other American cities. So we start to see as the homosexual movement starts to take a little bit of traction, it becomes institutionalized, we can see that there were some other rights or marches that took place, generally peaceful at that point in time uh, in that way. Letter E in 1989, a book entitled After the Ball, 
How America Will Conquer Its Fear and Hatred of Gays in the 90s was written by Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madsen. And you know, we think about that book as instrumental in helping to normalize and to give uh, an idea about a strategy. In fact, that's the bullet underneath of that. This book became the written strategy for homosexual revelation, revolution in America. As we think about that revolution, you say, what did that book focus on? So we think about the strategy and the revolution that was to follow. We can see that revolution continuing even today. What does that look like? How was it described in that book? Number one, it focused on changing America's culture, not just its laws. And understanding that when it comes to changing a nation or anything that goes on, laws are important, but culture is important as well. And uh, they focused, uh, or that book talked about focusing on the culture and influencing individuals, not just the laws that uh, represented okayed or limited uh, homosexuality in America. Uh, number two, it described the AIDS crisis as an insurmountable opportunity to establish homosexuals as a victimized minority deserving of America's special protection and care. Now, if you remember, if you go back to the, the 1980s, how many of you remember, you go back to that time, and the AIDS epidemic really started to come to fruition. And during that time, there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of questions about what AIDS was. How did it come about? What was going on with it? And um, when it came to that time, we can see through this book and during this period of time because of the book and uh, other influences, we can see how uh, the homosexual movement really tried to change and to use AIDS as an opportunity to uh, victimize or create a victim mentality uh, for those and to cause uh, essentially people to kind of have a pity mindset uh, for homosexuals at that point in time. Number three, it advocated the need to reach out to liberal churches to become cultural allies. In fact, if you look at the LGBTQ, blah, 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 uh, there's an idea about there, the idea of people who are allies of homosexuals as well. And when it comes to that movement, we can see how in the book, and even currently, we can see that there's a rise of churches who have also espoused the homosexual movement. In fact, you see this time and time again, many denominations and groups who have even ordained homosexual pastors and so on and so forth. And so we can see that it has taken root. Number four, uh, it called upon the movement to portray gays as victims, not aggressive challengers. Of course, sometimes early on, homosexuality was considered to be a challenge to the culture, which it is but understand they really tried to change the narrative to portray uh, homosexual folks as victims in the community as well. Number five, we're still talking about that book. Its authors argued, quote, for all practical purposes, gays should be considered to have been born gay. So when it comes to the idea that somebody is homosexual, to try to promote the idea that, hey, they had no choice. They are just naturally this way because they were born this way. So we see that narrative today as well. If somebody is homosexual, they're just that way because they were born that way as well. Then number six, uh, it promoted a strategy that would make homosexuals look good and make victimizers look bad. That seems to make sense, right? So trying to flip the table over a bit and trying to make it more normal for homosexual lifestyles to be normal and anybody who opposed homosexuality to be the people who were the opposers and trying to subject those who were so much homosexual. No, letter F there, until the 1970s, both the American Psychiatric Association and the American Psychological Association held that same-sex attraction was a form of mental illness. And of course, we've seen that historically. A lot of things over time have changed, not just with homosexuality, but with other sins as well. And uh, we talked about some of that stuff. Um, even we start to think about gender dysphoria, those, all those kind of things have been considered to be mental illnesses. Uh, here's the bullet there. By focusing on the no nomenclature committee of the American Psychiatric Association, here's what it says, the language was changed from mental illness to sexual orientation disturbance. Do we hear a lot about sexual orientation today? Yes, in part because when it came to these two entities, uh, that nomenclature, which is a system of names used in the art, in an art or a science, it was changed. So rather than talking about it as being a mental illness, it was then changed to be sexual orientation. So that uh, when it comes to description, that's how the uh, APA uh, those two organizations refer to it. Letter G, oops, sorry, underneath of that, historian David Eisenbach wrote, the demise of the sickness model is a monumental event in the history of the gay rights 
movement. So we can see how things have changed, and because of the demise of the sickness model in the transition of how we think about homosexuality, it has prompted our world to be able to change to accept uh, the homosexual movement that has occurred. Hence, then letter G, on June 26, 2015, the United States Supreme Court ruled that bans on same-sex marriage are unconstitutional by a five to four majority. Now we think about when it comes to same-sex marriage, that's going to be the subject of our next lesson. Now we're going to take a break through the summertime as we go through our study in the fruit of the Spirit. So kind of hang on to that until we get into the month of August. Uh, but we'll be uh, speaking about and looking at the subject of same-sex marriage, looking at other topics as well, because we think about where we were in the previous study, America's sexual revolution, uh, it really kind of propagated a lot of the things that are starting to happen now. Homosexual movement, uh, we start to think some of the things I've mentioned to you recently, we'll talk about transhumanism. Uh, when it comes to the idea, New York has been considering a law that will make it legal for parents to legally marry their children, legal incest as an example. So when it comes to the sexual revolution that we've been talking about, it doesn't stop there. There's a lot of other stuff that's becoming normalized when we can start to change definitions. And so the initial idea of the um, sexual revolution did not probably have in mind all of these other ideas, but it has transferred and changed into all of these weird ideas. And uh, we're assuming those weird ideas and trying to make them normal. So we start to think about that, Roman numeral two. We think about some of these burning issues. When it comes to America's homosexual movement, what are some of the burning uh, questions that we need to consider? Well, letter A, we have to go back to some of these ideas that were communicated, as an example, by the American Psychological Association uh, about books that have been written, the movement itself. Here's a question. Letter A, are people born homosexuals? So trying to ask this question, are people born Homosexual. Try to get some ideas about that. Well, number one, I'm going to give you a simple, pretty simple answer. No. People are not born homosexual. In fact, there's no scientific evidence to suggest that an individual can be born with a same-sex attraction. So we start to think about that. It doesn't seem to be that it's possible to happen that way. Of course, the largest study on genetics and same-sexual behavior was published in September of 2019. And based on the genomes of the people that they did a report and study on, 500,000 people, uh, the lead study author, Andrea Gana, who's a geneticist at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, said this, there is no gay gene. And so when it came to that study, scientifically, at least at this moment in time, they've not been able to prove that there's some type of a, a gay gene, if you will, or a homosexual gene that says somebody is born to be homosexual. So number two, biblical teaching reminds us that the consequences of the fall of man in Genesis 3 are so comprehensive that we should expect sin to impact everything about us, even what? Molecular structure. The fact is this, as being created beings and then the fall, I believe this, that you and I, we are not as smart. We are not as strong. We are not as fast. Obviously, we don't live as long as Adam and Eve and our forefathers when they were first created. And when it comes to those things, we understand that sin over time has certainly impacted us. So here's a couple of thoughts to think about. Letter A, in fact, if a genetic link explaining same-sex attraction is ever truly discovered, as Christians, we should be the least surprised. The fact is, is that when it comes to who we are, we have been changed uh, when it comes to who we are as a people. And so sin has certainly taken uh, a hold in the human body. Letter B, the discovery of a gay gene would not force believers to abandon or uh, our biblical position on the sinfulness of homosexuality, nor would it nullify the clear teaching of Scripture or, in, uh, or validate same-sex attraction. We understand when it comes to Scripture uh, that Scripture is true. By the way, our perspectives on all of life need to be derived through Scripture. It's kind of a sad thing this last year. One of the things that we've heard time and time and time again was this expression, hey, we follow the what? We follow the science. Think about it. We have to make sure when it comes to science that science always needs to be interpreted. History always needs to be interpreted. Life needs to be interpreted. How? Through the lens of Scripture. And so as we think about that, 
Um, when it comes to life, uh, we know that uh, our position would not be nullified just because of a scientific experiment, as an example. So studies by John Hopkins University, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Evelyn Hooker, who's a pro-homosexual scientist, and Masters and Johnston all deny there's any genetic link. They all agree that the connection between genetics and homosexuality is a wishful myth. So number three here, if sexual orientation is fixed from birth, why do some homosexuals switch to heterosexuality? Again, we start to think about the LGBTQ plus, plus uh, all the different initials that are there. Uh, as we think about that, uh, there are some people who switch, if you will. They are homosexual one day, and then at some point on, they decide to be heterosexual uh, or uh, change to even change again if they wanted to. So we think about that. Uh, if they were born one way, why do they continue to change? Number four, what about identical twins, of which I happen to be, but with exact, the exact same genes where one twin is heterosexual and the other is homosexual? So to think about twins, as an example, if, one, if they were born being homosexual, why is one heterosexual and another one could also be homosexual? So in that case, we think about it, especially if they have the same gene. So one final question is, how is the gene passed on when homosexuals cannot reproduce uh, in that way too? So when it comes to that in the long term, um, we know that homosexuality, there is an end. It does not produce an offspring. Letter B, if there is no certain genetic link to homosexuality, then what are the possible causes? These are things that we have to uh, take in and to understand. We've been trying to understand this in a uh, sociological type of a way, trying to understand why is it that homosexuality is on such a rise in our country and around the world. Well, there's several different things we can consider. Again, these are just simple factors, but number one, parental factors, parental factors. Uh, when it comes to rearing our children, we have to make sure that we rear our children uh, and to encourage them in their relationships uh, as well. We think about this when it comes to parental factors. Uh, oftentimes, some of the things that they say could be linked to uh, homosexuality, uh, could be uh, absent parents, abusive parents, and disengaged fathers. Uh, we also look at this, a smothering and a domineering mother can also be a relationship uh, in a home that can contribute toward a child becoming homosexual. Number two, I'm not saying they have to, but these are some of the factors. Number two, developmental factors, uh, failure to bond with parents in a healthy way. Oftentimes, the children do not have a healthy relationship with their parents. It may it could lead them toward becoming homosexual. Uh, what about sexual abuse? I think this is one of the big ones as well in our culture, in our world. Uh, we can see this happening a lot in our society. Uh, so sexual abuse has a tendency to lead people toward homosexuality, as well as misinformation regarding sexuality. Uh, and trying to, when it comes to our world, and all the kinds of ideas, opinions, and things that are shown, uh, there's a lot of confusion about what proper sexuality is uh, when we deny what it is that God has created. Uh, we also look at number three, some environmental factors. What are some things that are going on in our world that have a tendency to lead or to lend toward uh, homosexuality? Well, there's the media's influence on matters of sexuality. In the fact, when it comes to our world, you ever watch a TV show and you're just kind of shocked because all of a sudden, either in the background or overtly, and now when it comes to cartoons, Disney does it, it's like, it's like in your face. And it becomes this normal idea, and you're faced with that question, do I watch it, do I turn it off, right? And when you start to think about what's going on in our culture, it seems like, ah, it's not that big of a deal. Whereas in times past, it was a big deal. And so we become more numb to it over time. So the media's influence, what about society's normalization of homosexuality as well? It seems to be pretty normal in a lot of ways. Let me just ask you a question. How many of you know or have met somebody who has uh, claimed or is homosexual? Let me see your hand. Okay, most of you. Okay, it's very, it used to be uh, rare for some people that way, uh, but understand when it comes, it's becoming much more prevalent. Most of us know people who have been or are homosexual uh, as well. So it's pretty normal. And then also influence of friends and or family members toward homosexuality. So where once it was something that was more taboo, it seems to be much more acceptable uh, today. Letter C, what about the homosexuals call for tolerance? Tolerance, once you think about this, 
Uh, we, when it comes to the idea, oftentimes homosexuals uh, will ask us to be tolerant of their lifestyle. Let's kind of follow the logic a little bit about this. This is really a play from their playbook that we just read about or talked about just a few moments ago. Number one, those who are most likely to demand tolerance are not willing to tolerate those whom they believe are intolerant. As an example, a lot of the push today is against traditional marriage, against churches that preach the truth about proper sexuality based off of Scripture. And so when it comes to that, they will ask us to be tolerant, but at the same time, many times we can see that homosexuals are not tolerant of Scripture or Christian truth. And so when it comes to these, if you will, it's supposed to go both ways, if it were uh, that way. But number two there, they discourage a Christian's intolerance on homosexuality. It's kind of the point I was making there in the previous point. Yet they do not tolerate many things, including rape, murder, racism, pollution, etc. So it's kind of like this idea, like, okay, uh, general culture is supposed to approve of this. We're supposed to be tolerant of this sin uh, and this idea. They wouldn't call it a sin, obviously. But when it comes to rape, murder, racism, they say, oh, well, those things are off limits. We shouldn't tolerate that. And so you have to ask that question, at what point do you stop? It's kind of like going back to the sexual revolution and uh, all these dominoes that are lined up. And for somebody to say, well, this is right and this is wrong. Well, which one's right and which one's wrong? Do we just vote on it in our culture and society? Or does God have some moral absolutes that are taught? Which is, by the way, what we believe. But when it comes to these ideas, we need to understand that um, there seems to be a, a, a wish and a desire to be tolerated but oftentimes there's an intolerance that is communicated by the homosexual um, uh, agenda. Number three, we don't tolerate good. You ever think about that? We don't tolerate good. In fact, we're going to be looking at the fruit of the Spirit here next week. We think about that and think about there's no law against the fruit of the Spirit, right? If you were to go to any nation in the world, there's not going to be a law that says you're not supposed to be loving, kind, good, right? So we, there's not laws we're not supposed to be tolerant against things that are good. Uh, so only things that are negative or evil have a tendency to, uh, to be asked to be tolerated. Whoever heard of, heard of tolerating something good, as an example, I love my wife, so I tolerate her, right? So understanding that, so that would be a ridiculous statement to make. I love my wife, and so I don't tolerate her. I love her. I want to be with her. And so in this sense here, this tolerance argument is an implicit admission that homosexual practices are not good. So we think about the logic of this idea for tolerance, and we have to be careful um, with that and just make sure that we understand it. Uh, of course, it does play into the idea earlier that we talked about as far as the victimhood mentality and trying to play on that and trying to create the other people over top of them as being the oppressor. And you know, we see a lot of that when it comes to the cultural uh, things that are going on right now too. Roman numeral three, some biblical insight, and we'll wrap this up tonight. Biblical insight, letter A. The biblical term for homosexual behavior is sodomy. We see that in the scripture, uh, 1 Kings 14, 24, and there were also sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So we see that term in scripture. Hence, number one there, the term sodomy is named after the inhabitants of who? Or what city? The city of Sodom, whose homosexual, homosexual perversion cause God to rain fire on their city. You can go back to Genesis 19 and read that story, and we can see how it was in verse 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. So we think about why it was. If we go back to verse number 5, it uses the word no. In verse number 5 uh, says these words in describing, and they called unto Lot, the Sodomites, the people, the guys, the people who were there in the city, and said unto him, "We are uh, unto him. We, where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us." Then it uses this word that we know them. The term "know" there is not just "Hey, we want to get to be buddies with these guys," but literally, it's the same word that is translated in Genesis 4:1, where Adam knew Eve, meaning they had a sexual relationship from which children eventually came. In this case here, in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, that same word being used, and they were requesting sexual relationships with the men that they thought came, which indeed were angels, at which point we understand that God reigned fire 
fire on the city. Number two, God viewed the sin of sodomy to be so despicable that he called for there to be separation from sodomites. If you were to look at the law, when it came to the Israelites, when it came to their nation, they were supposed to make sure that they separated from sodomite folks as well as remove sodomites from their communities as well. So we understand there's the biblical foundation that we see in Scripture for that. Letter B, homosexual acts are clearly and absolutely prohibited in Scripture. You say, is it okay? No, the Bible says it's not okay. So we see, number one, the standards of God's people were not and are not to be dictated by the practices of wicked people. When it comes to our nation, when it comes to our people, when it comes to our lives, we're not culture and say, okay, whatever the culture is doing, that's good for me. No, God said we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to not be following uh, what the world's doing. Second Corinthians, and uh, we look there in 6.17, wherefore come out, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So we learn here that it is not okay. Letter A, homosexuality is one of those things that was condemned and not allowed. We read that verse in Le Leviticus 18.22, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. So letter B there, it is important to note the many other sexual perversions are also condemned in the passage itself as well. If you we were to study those passages, you would see that it's not just homosexuality uh, that the Bible talks about, that, but there are other sexual perversions as well that we ought not to participate in. So because of that, every sexual relationship except that between a heterosexual couple in marriage is prohibited. So when it comes to sexual relationship, God has guide rails. God has uh, rules, if you will, established for the protection of the marriage, the home, the, the first foundational unit that God has created in his world. God put it together. It's supposed to be protected. And yet mankind and Satan, because of sin, guess what? We try to destroy the picture that God made in us and for the Lord. Number two, in the New Testament, of course, we've been looking at some Old Testament passages. Twenty-four to thirty-two. It describes this passage, uh, or in this passage, uh, relationships in kind of a, a progression of some things that have happened in our world, and uh, in for specifically verse number twenty-six. Well, let's start in verse uh, twenty-four, just for context. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the create creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving themselves the recompense of the error which was meet. So we look at this, we understand that in the description uh, uh, that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote here in his letter, uh, that uh, New Testament, the Apostle Paul dealt with a listing of sinful behaviors. Of those was homosexuality. If you look down at verse number 29, it says, being filled with all unrighteousness. He says fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, so on and so forth. He also describes along with that the idea of fornication, which is other sexual sin. So it's kind of thinking about that. Letter C, homosexual practice may be both overcome and forgiven. Now, we looked at this verse before when it came to looking at the sexual revolution in the United States. I want to draw your attention back to it again because of a very specific reason. I have heard, I have studied, I have listened to uh, different people try to promote an idea that homosexuality cannot be forgiven. By the way, I'm going to make that very clear. God can forgive homosexuality, okay? Uh, in fact, uh, once a homosexual, somebody says, always a homosexual. It doesn't have to be true any more than one person has been a drunk, and they've always been a drunk. Is there hope? Can God change a heart and a life? Absolutely. Uh, I'll say it this way. It's really interesting that as the layers of the onion of sin in culture get kind of systematically pulled back, there's the stigma that stands out as an example. The conscience of the world used to be shocked 
when somebody got drunk. But nowadays, it's pretty commonplace. Or eventually in time and in communities, uh, people used to be shocked when somebody had an adulterous relationship or they were living with somebody before they got married. Now it seems pretty much to be commonplace. And homosexuality is seeming to become commonplace and newer frontiers of sin are standing in their place, such as, as we talked about, legalized polygamy, legalized prostitution, which by the way was debated and talked about in our own uh, state legislature here in the state of Louisiana, uh, even this past month. Understand, it is something that's being debated, it is something that's uh, being talked about, and legalized incestuous marriage, as we've talked about just a little bit ago as well. So some churches wrongly preach and teach that homosexuality cannot be forgiven or changed because when they read into Romans uh, 128 is that God gives them over to a reprobate, reprobate mind, meaning their thoughts are evil and do not fit what is right, and therefore they cannot be saved, they cannot be converted. But understand, we understand uh, that God has something else to say about that. I will say this as, as well. Be careful. Because one such group calls themselves a new form of new independent Baptist churches. And there are some, even in our area, one or two who have even visited our church over the last few years, but they are not independent fundamental Baptists. If you want more information on them, I'd be happy to provide it to you. But understand, they have a lot of weird ideas, one of which is homosexuals, homosexuals cannot be saved. We understand that according to the Word of God, it's foolish to think that God cannot redeem reprobates, no matter who they are. In fact, we think about the Word of God, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Why don't you look, about, look, at, look back at it with me. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? How many of you have ever been unrighteous? Guess what? We ain't going to heaven were it not for Jesus Christ. In fact, he continues to say that. He says, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So in that list, we understand there's a whole litany of stuff that's covered. And guess what? It says in verse number 11, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Let me ask you a question. Have you been redeemed? I'm thankful that Jesus Christ washes away all sin. There's but one sin that cannot be forgiven, and that is the rejecting or choosing sin and self over the love of our Savior who came to forgive you and to give you and me his righteousness. We think about the opportunity to know Christ as Savior. I want to encourage you. Let's walk with Christ. And, by the way, when you encounter anybody who is a sinner, let's love them like Jesus did no matter the sin. Let's remind them that Jesus loves them. He hates all sin. There's a penalty for sin, but understand this too. He died for all of us. If you look at the statement at the end of your notes, it says, by Randy Alcorn says, through its masterful use of the power of both politics and religion, the homosexual movement has succeeded in radically affecting the sexual morality of millions of Americans and passing on to future generations an entirely different view of human sexuality. You say, so what's the hope? How do we change generations still yet to come? Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and help them to know the truth of the word of God. That there's forgiveness, there's hope, and there's life found in him. Would you pray with me tonight? Lord Jesus, I thank you for the word of God and how it reminds us and teaches us about how we ought to live. Lord, I thank you for your uh, word and for the truth that you provide to us. And Lord, when it comes to the opportunity we have in this world to preach the gospel, the life that you provide, help us to share your truth with others that they might also come to know Jesus Christ no matter what the sin may be. Tonight, we've been talking about the specific sin of homosexuality. But Lord, whatever the sin may be in our lives, in our hearts, we know that you forgive, and we want to thank you for that. We praise you for the passage that we just read in 1 Corinthians, how it reminds us, after listing all kinds of sins, it says, and such were some of you. Lord, tonight, Christians all over, 
We can lift our hands and we can praise you. We can say, Lord, thank you for saving my soul. Lord, thank you for making me whole. Lord, for others that we know, whatever sins may be in their lives, we ask that you would help us to continue to preach the gospel to them. They might know whatever sins may be in their lives, they can be forgiven. There's hope, there's life, there's forgiveness.